Hello viewers, welcome to Indian Masterminds. Today we have with us former Foreign Secretary of India, Nirupama Menon Rao. She's just come out with a new book called The Fractured Himalaya. And today we are going to discuss this book with her. Welcome to Indian Masterminds, ma'am. And Thank first of all, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy to be here discussing it with you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, since Indian Masterminds is exclusively for uh, the Indian bureaucrats and we also focus on UPSC exam, uh, we would like to know about your rank in civil service exam and why you chose uh, Indian Foreign Service. Well, I took the UPSC exam when I was 22 years old. As soon as I was eligible to write the exam, I had just done my masters in English literature and I was in the city of Aurangabad in Maharashtra. My parents were there so I was with them and uh, those days Aurangabad did not even have a center for writing the exam so I had to come to Delhi and stay with some relatives and write the exam. So it was quite an expedition to come from Maharashtra, from Aurangabad, from Maratwada coming to Delhi. So I wrote the exam, I did not, and uh, we didn't have any coaching classes or anything in Aurangabad. So I had to study on my own, but we had a very good library in Marathwada University, which is now called the Baba Sahib Ambedkar University, as you know, beautiful library. So I had access to all the material and I prepared on my own and I took the exam. I went to the UPSC uh, headquarters in Shah Jahan Road to write the exam, I remember. And uh, as uh, luck would have it, I topped the list of both the IAS and the IFS. There, there were two, I mean, the Indian Administrative Service and the Indian Foreign Service, they were considered the top services at that time. And in fact, the IFS had a greater premium because uh, to get into right. the IFS, only very few people made it from the top of the list actually. But I made it, I was number one in the Foreign Service and number one in the IAS also. So, you know, my parents and my, um, uh, you know, relatives and uncles and aunties and all wanted me to join the IAS because I would have got my state, which is Kerala. I would have walked into the Kerala cadre. I would have been living in Kerala among my own people. But I had this desire from the age of 12 uh, to join the Foreign Service. I was very interested in current affairs, foreign affairs, uh, you know, other countries. I was very fond of history. So that was my dream to join the Foreign Service. So I told my parents that whatever you say, I want to join the Foreign Service. This is my dream. This is my ambition and this is what I wanted. And I was very fortunate that I had parents who supported me because as you know, in Indian families, uh, if the parents take a view, take a stand, sometimes it's very difficult for the children to, to object, especially if we are female children, particularly, as you know, in our country, that's the way it is. But they understood my aspirations and they, uh, they gave me that love and support, I think, that enabled me to, to take the decision to join the Foreign Service. So that's how I joined the Foreign Service. I think it's a wonderful career, and I don't believe it's understood well enough uh, among the young people of the country. An enormously uh, fulfilling career, a lot of intellectual satisfaction, a lot of uh, scope uh, to serve the country and to do good for the country, to represent the country, to speak for the country. So you become the voice of, of the country, literally. So I think uh, we must see more and more young people uh, join the foreign service and I hope that will happen. I hope uh, you know they will understand the beauty of this career and and uh, and the real satisfaction and fulfillment you can get from being a diplomat who serves uh, India, who serves our nation. Uh, at that time, uh, most of the top rankers used to prefer Indian Foreign Service, but now uh, this, uh, we see the trend that most of the toppers, they prefer to go for uh, IS, Indian Administrative Service. So uh, what is the reason that uh, you feel uh, for this change in trend? Well, I, I believe that uh, the whole nature of uh, the uh, the 
situations that we are in today has changed from, from the 70s when I took the exam. Today, India is globalized. India is in contact with the world. Uh, you know, traveling to any part of, uh, of uh, the globe has become so much easier. Information is, is available to all. So uh, many young people, uh, I suppose, uh, need not even want to explore new regions because it's there at your fingertip in the palm of your hand. In my time, that was not at all the case. You wanted to go to other countries. You wanted to see what it was like because you didn't have the opportunity to really visualize right. anything about those places, which you can today. The second thing is that the, uh, the uh, people uh, who join, the, uh, who take the exam today, uh, they, uh, they don't come from the big cities so much as from all across the country. So it's become really democratized. That's a wonderful thing that has happened because, you know, the people who take the exam represent India, I believe, uh, from every corner of the country they come. And uh, their exposure, they, they don't know much about the Foreign Service. You can't blame them because they have interacted with the IAS officers, with the district magistrates, the SDMs. They see, you know, the kind of power and responsibility that they hold. And that is very attractive to a young person, naturally, you know, the respect of office that a young IAS officer receives, you know, in those first few years of service is tremendous. I think it's wonderful. And uh, I don't blame young people for saying they want to, to join the IAS because they see these people, they see the way they are doing good for, for the local population. Whereas they don't come into touch with diplomats because, you know, we are sitting in Delhi in the Ministry of External Affairs or we are in some embassy abroad. So there's no scope for that kind of interaction and understanding. I think these are the really uh, the, the two reasons. And I think that uh, uh, we, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and we in the Foreign Service, we need to really be able to propagate the idea of being a professional diplomat uh, much more effectively and powerfully. So, you know, that's where I think um, uh, uh, information campaign about the Foreign Service and about what we do and why it is such an attractive career, that needs to be consciously promoted in a, in a kind of mission mode so that young people are attracted to the Foreign Service. And once again, it becomes you know, the top service uh, which people aspire to when they take the exam. I hope that that day will come. But everywhere in the world, Foreign Service officers, you know, they enjoy a lot of prestige, a lot of respect. It's, it's a very, very, um, a very uh, respected profession through history. You know, it's di diplomats who have made history. If you look at the history of peace, uh, the, you know, peace agreements, peace treaties, uh, you know, the uh, big figures in history have all been diplomats uh, and they've been working in the field of foreign policy. So young people also need to know, understand history also a little better. Uh, I, we get a lot of science students, brilliant people who enter the, enter the services, but I think a grounding in the humanities is also very essential so that you understand these historical aspects better. And that will enable you also to form a good understanding of what diplomats do and how important they are for the country. Uh, looking back, uh, how successful do you feel has been your journey in foreign service? and what uh, are, were your major achievements, according to you? I don't believe I should be blowing my own trumpet. That's not, not why I'm here. I, uh, I think uh, you know, it's for others to judge what I've done, but I can only say that uh, I consider myself very blessed and very fortunate to have been able to serve my country uh, through a diplomatic career as a representative of India abroad. Uh, from the beginning, whatever, whatever postings and assignments I did, I, I found them very interesting, very absorbing. And uh, I was able to help people reach out to people, show the human face of government in many ways, which is what you do when you help people in need, Indians who are in need uh, across the world when they come to the embassy. I think uh, one learned to be responsive, one learned to be humanitarian and uh, compassionate. 
So diplomacy is also, a, it teach, teaches you the art of compassion also when you're dealing with fellow human beings in need and you reach out to them and just the act of helping them gives you so much satisfaction and, and fulfillment that you've been able to do something to help them. I think I was able to work a lot on China and able to contribute to many of the agreements that we signed to build confidence. I became India's first woman ambassador to, to China. It was also a privilege to be India's first woman spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs to stand before the cameras and to speak for India. Uh, what greater honor could there be? So I was very fortunate that I was selected to do that and the government and the ministry had faith in me, had confidence in me uh, to do that. I served in Sri Lanka as the first Indian woman high commissioner there. Again, in a very trying time during the civil war, in a time when the country had been afflicted by conflict and terrorism and uh, to be able to uh, speak about the need for reconciliation, to speak about the need to respect minority rights, uh, to, to have tolerance, uh, a spirit of tolerance, and again, of compassion for those who had suffered as a result of the conflict, for the people who had lost their, their family members, their serving members on both sides. And, uh, and to, to also put across uh, on behalf of India, what we wanted, that we wanted the country to stay united, not to break apart, not to be separated in any way. So uh, I think uh, from all these counts, whatever I did, and to be foreign secretary of the country and uh, to represent, to be the senior most member of the foreign service and, and um, in a sense, uh, to speak for the service also, to speak for you know, our diplomats wherever I went and to deal with very sensitive neighborhood assignments, neighborhood relationships, uh, to be able to interact with other uh, ministries of the government of India, to be able to brief, uh, you know, uh, the then prime minister or the head of state, the then president uh, about these relationships. So the, 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 uh, the quantum of responsibility that is on your shoulders is considerable. It's considerable. So we are dealing with very sensitive matters as we go up in the service and we deal with these uh, very delicate relationships that India has with various countries. So it, it teaches you a lot uh, in the process. I felt, felt uh, what I have become today is because of the career I had and the environment in which I was placed and the circumstances and uh, challenges I had to deal with. So it's like being put through, like, like you put uh, you know, yourself through some kind of a, a, a process of evolution, of uh, becoming um, a, a more uh, multifaceted person as a result. You know, whether it's in the field of politics or economics or art and culture, or media and communication, all these things. I think it's such a well-rounded career that, uh, that a diplomat has that you really grow uh, into, uh, you become, you, you, you do not stop growing, let me say that. You do not stop growing. You're constantly evolving and growing and understanding and, uh, and uh, expanding your knowledge. There is no end to what you can do uh, to, and also to what you can learn, because ultimately, you know, we are all citizens of the world also. We cannot, you know, lock ourselves alone within national frontiers. We have to look outward. We have to learn from outside and the best practices that are there everywhere. So that's something also the role of a diplomat uh, is very important from that point of view, because what you can bring back to the country in terms of know-how, in terms of ideas, concepts, innovation, and also to build bridges between people everywhere so that the country, our India, benefits from it. You mentioned uh, challenges that you have to face. So what were the major challenges before you? Well, I faced many challenges, whether it's ethnic riots in Sri Lanka when I was a young diplomat, uh, the tsunami much later when I was high commissioner in Sri Lanka. Many years later, I went back to Sri Lanka. Uh, in China, the China relationship is always very sensitive, very, very, you know, it requires a lot of attention. It's a high maintenance relationship, let's put it that way. 
uh, in the, uh, in Peru when I was uh, there on my first ambassadorship. I just missed being taken hostage by a group of terrorists because I had left the Japanese embassy just in time, a few minutes before it was raided by this group and the people were taken hostage. So I, I escaped by a hair's breadth at that time. Uh, so in many, I, I, you know, I cannot enumerate the challenges. Uh, while I was foreign secretary, we had so much, uh, you know, going on vis-a-vis -vis our presence in Afghanistan, for instance. And uh, I, you know, that's just one example. But all in all, I think uh, in any uh, in any part of government, whatever you do, whether you're in the foreign service, whether you're in the forest service, whether you're in the administrative service or the revenue service. You face a number of challenges. You face difficult situations. You are there to try and resolve them. You are try. You are there to, to make things better. You know, there's a sign about the Vidan Sauda in Bangalore, where I live, uh, which says very, very loud, uh, big letters. It says, "Government's work is God's work." Government's work is God's work. And I've always proceeded on that principle. I don't want to sound pompous or I don't want to sound, you know, uh, too lofty. But I think, yes, when you're entrusted with that kind of responsibility, it's a divine responsibility. You can't play God. I'm not saying you should play God, but you should understand you are there to do good and not to do harm. Do no harm. As you know, the doctors, medical doctors take that oath the oath of Hippocrates, Hippocrates, the Greek, uh, you know, the first physician, the, the oath really says, do no harm. And that I think should be your motto. Thank you, ma'am. Any message for uh, the bureaucrats, especially the young bureaucrats? Well, I would say the world is in your hands. Uh, make India great. Uh, never lose sight of that uh, aim. That should be your ambition and uh, cultivate transparency, cultivate openness, cultivate compassion, as I said, and always work to the highest standards. You, you should have the ability to deliver. You know, it's not just uh, speaking about what plans you have or what, uh, you know, um, uh, programs you want uh, to, to put in place, but show through your actions, show actually that you can bring about change. I think you should be agents for change, change for the progress of the country. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving us your valuable time. It's been a pleasure having you with us and all the very best for your book. Thank you, so, Thank you so much. And please, uh, please do uh, tell uh, our audience and young bureaucrats to read the book and to learn about the relationship that we have with China uh, from it, to understand the history. Because once you understand history, then the present and the future, uh, it's, it's much easier to tackle the present and address the future. So viewers, that was Nirupama Menon Rao talking about her new book, The Fractured Himalaya. Do go out and buy the book and read it to know why she refers to the Himalayas as fractured. So thank you for watching and thank you, ma'am, once again from all of us at Indian Masterminds. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best. Thank you, ma'am.